now from Hollywood, California, the horror capital of the world, the Boulay Brothers, Creatures of the Night. Welcome back to Creatures of the Night Uglies. Okay, so as you all know, we went to the premiere of Alien Romulus recently. And if you are a listener of the podcast, then you know that is something that would trigger us. And what I mean by that (laughs) is it triggered us into having to go back and watch every version of Alien that's ever came out, which we did. Yeah, we're kind of still in it. I think we what we did was like, okay, now we need to research what is the order of the films, because that's confusing. Like the storyline, we all know when they came out, but the storyline is Prometheus. And we're not counting like Alien vs. Predator and Alien vs. Predator Re- Requiem. We're no, not doing that. No. We're not doing that today. We can't, we can't do that. Um, but Prometheus, Alien Covenant, Alien, Alien Romulus, Romulus, Aliens, Aliens. And then we're on Aliens 3. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and I think we're going to bring Ian in early because he loves Aliens. Yes. So, Ian, welcome to the show. Ooh, I just left my face hugger in my room. <laughs> I hope I don't chest burst over the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, how are you both? We're good. Excellent. We're aliened out, but I'm excited to talk about it. I'm obsessed yes. because I'm like, okay, we have to go do the podcast. And like, I had another commitment today, but I was like... I really just want to get home tonight and watch the rest of Billions 3. Yes, <laughs> yes. Okay, without maybe too many spoilers, I mean, the movie is a thousand years old. Like, where are you at in Alien 3? It, we're not that far in. Just so, started. That yeah, one. she's Ooh. on the planet. You're, they're establishing the fact that she's the only female and she needs to shave her head. And um, I, my, my little problem with the beginning of this movie is somehow there's a face hugger on her escape shuttle. The one with mm. new and um. I forget the synthetic from Alien. Oh yeah. my God. I was like, what was her name? Snail? I was like, oh. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Yes. Snail, snail was dead. I could yes. not believe that. Shell yeah. crushed. Yeah. Slime <laughs> dried up. <laughs> Newt salted. I mean, I was glad, but I wanted her to die in the other movie. Honestly, she was annoying. <laughs> As the credits were rolling, Drac was like, it, or, or when we saw Newt was dead in three, Drac was like, oh, I mean, cool but it would have been a lot more impactful had she died at the end of I'm like, why oh you just let her, cause remember, I don't know if you remember how well you remember these movies because like I said before we got on the podcast I've seen these movies but watching them again <laughs> I'm like I've never seen any of these movies yeah there's so much stuff I was like I don't remember any of this but that being one of them so yeah at the in in the end of Aliens 2 or towards the end Newt gets separated mm-hmm. she like falls down a shaft and then uh, Ridley, <laughs> Ridley Scott goes and then up. she's like New goes down the shaft the Riddler and Penguin go upstairs <laughs> and then Batman says get away from her you bitch and Ridley Scott comes out of the corner <laughs> he's an engineer yes. aka maker from World of Warcraft same thing basically, basically. Um, okay let me <laughs> Back it up. Yeah. So Newt gets separated from Ridley. Yes. Ridley goes down, finds her in the water, and then remember, an alien appears and pulls her away. Mm-hmm. Which I'm like, that would have been great if she was just dead there. <laughs> I think it would be very exciting and unexpected, right? Well, it made it, yeah. it made it seem kind of despair like and like, okay, it's not going to be like a cutesy, we can't kill the kid kind of movie. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's the thing about aliens that this is a big shocker for me. Like, I really like the fact that it is sort of macho action focused. Yeah. Like it's more fun than alien. I mean, even though I think alien is blast, but it definitely has that iconic get away from her. You bitch like this mech versus the queen fight. And You're- it just is Fun. You're skipping over the best character, Vasquez. Oh, oh 100%. <laughs> you yes. know, you know. Like, as soon as she came on screen, Jack was like, oh, my God, you love her. <laughs> oh, girl, we turn around, and you're in a full Vasquez cosplay <laughs> with a machine gun. She's like, hey, Vasquez, have you ever been mistaken for a man? No, have you? Oh, <laughs> get him, get him. Now, didn't we watch this movie with Darren Stein yes. at the, the Hollywood, Hollywood Forever, Forever Cemetery. Cemetery? They have, like, oh, all night, you my sit birthday. there. And oh watch God. movies all night long and don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. it. At first, I was like, this is so cool. We're going to spend the night. We're in the cemetery. And then it was like 3.30 and I'm like, Ugh. Oh, no. You're damp. Everyone's wet because of that weird froth mm-hmm. or whatever it is in L.A. that dumps on everybody. Not good. 
I mean, I think that if you're going to do an all night movie marathon, you have to be prepared because I don't know what happened. I got older, my synthetic aged 9,000 years in hypersleep, but I'm like one 90 minute movie. Good night. <laughs> I <can't laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Oh, my God. There was a time when we would literally just be up till dawn, like (laughs) on the regular. And that was like part of our work cycle and Mm -hmm. stuff. But now, no, ma'am. No. Oh, yeah. Couldn't be me. Okay, so look, I have some questions that I'd like to discuss after watching these alien movies. Okay. One, Prometheus and Covenant do not suck. And we're going to talk about why not. Because a lot of people say that they don't like it. I'm shocked. And I went when we did the rewatch and I was like, okay, let me try to look with these eyes. You know, the eyes of people that are saying that are like naysayers and they don't like the evolutionary process of what's presented in Prometheus Mm -hmm. and Covenant. But I think it's super cool because it's a complicated storyline. It Mm -hmm. goes back. It really pays homage and honors the vibe of the original alien. It's serious. It's not yeah. Vasquez with the giant, you know, battle gun, even though that's fun. This is like serious science, xenomorph, alien, crossbreeding, hybrid. Like it's, yeah. I mean, I liked it even more after watching it again. I think that Prometheus is one of those films and Covenant too, but they get better the longer they have been out because I think that there's something so eerie and weird like you know alien is basically like a haunted house movie like it's so cramped and small and then you go into covenant and it's like oh we're out in the open like no one's got their helmets on but it manages to be mega claustrophobic it's like there's nowhere to hide they're awesome yeah Yeah. and i think maybe people don't like them now this you know obviously not everyone that doesn't like them thinks the same way but i feel like maybe it's because people that were like fans of the originals in like the nineties and the eighties. Like they liked that when it was a little not so smart and a little more like Mm. what you're talking about, it was a little more macho and giant guns and it was more that vibe. Butch it up and dumb it down. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say, uh, incel horror, homophobic people, but you know, (laughs) same, same thing, right? You know, that's who I thought maybe didn't like it. Because to, to me, I like both versions. I do love the the gory, more campy 80s version of it where it's Sigourney Weavers in the giant suit and all mm-hmm. that stuff. But I also thought this was smart and it was an evolution. So I yeah. don't know. For me, Alien Covenant really shined out. Like my first time through, I thought, Maybe Prometheus was my favorite of the two, but I mean, after a rewatch, Covenant is so insidious and so sinister. Mm -hmm. Like, David is incredible. Like, I mean, what a character. And then we go on to meet Walter, and like, it's the same shape, model, but a a different make. And, you know, it's just, it's just so cool. I think the Prometheus and Covenant really further my favorite thing about the Alien franchise, which I didn't really even put together until I watched Romulus, which is, I love the synthetics. Yeah. Like, I think that the synthetics are the strangest and most unexpected part. You know, you sort of know how the xenomorph is going to act. It's the perfect predator. It's, It's just a hunter personified. But the synthetics always surprise me you know they're always mm-hmm. duplicitous and i yeah. just love them. it's the best character but even andy right and romulus yeah. not, not duplicitous mm-hmm. even though he got that chip upgrade and he got a little shady th- this was like a tr- <laughs> altruistic character yeah. you know but um it's the best character like mm-hmm. hi- hire me as an actor on in any alien movie and i want to play the synthetic i think it's like the best role no you're the lesbian with the gun <laughs> or the lesbian that. with the gun <laughs> yes yes all right now here's the big question In the original Alien, the crew lands on LV-426, right? And this takes place after Covenant, where we just learned that David sort of created the Xenomorphs, right? So if that's the case, how did one of the engineer ships end up on LV-426 with a Xenomorph on it? Doesn't make a lot of sense. Or a face hugger or whatever it was is on it. I I got to go to the library. No, <laughs> I need to, for for stuff like that. A lot of information gets transmitted really quickly, like in dialogue moments, and they talk. You know, oh, and you if you blink or you walk out of the room for a minute, you might miss the little piece that you need to like put it all together. I don't think they would have made kind of a huge kind of glaring mistake in the storyline because it seems like they went to painstaking lengths to maintain some continuity throughout all the movies the, the short answer is i don't know but maybe you, you could answer that if you watched again that was a lot of dialogue for a non-answer <laughs> well it was an answer 
Maybe you need to adjust those headphones because I said I don't know. <laughs> do you, what do you think? Do you know? I'm going to mirror the words of a very wise seer, seamstress, uh, nightmare creature that I once uh, I once knew and say uh, everything that Swan just said. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one problem I have with it, because I do think with Prometheus and Covenant, they just built upon the story that was there and didn't change it much. But I'm like, that is a big thing to miss. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a total sidebar about Prometheus. Yeah, go. This, Prometheus is one of my only... I'm going to stretch before I reach moments in film. And I have this theory that I really like, and it sort of is my headcanon, that Charlize Theron's character is trans in a okay. film. Hmm. Basically, the reason why I think that is there's obviously, or I think that there is a queerness to her character already. She is one of the only female commander characters we get in the franchise, and she sort of is at odds with her dad the yeah. whole time. You know, he's like, I wish I had a son. Like, there's a lot of dialogue that kind of indicates, like, I don't like you because you're my daughter. Mm -hmm. And then later, when the main character, whose name I can't remember, Numi Rapace's character, when she gets into Charlize Theron's med pod, it's set up for a male body. Oh, when she goes to do the, the cesarean. Yeah. yeah. Elizabeth Shaw. Yes, yes, yes. When, when Shaw gets into the med pod, there's dialogue where it's like, there's no C-section. The only thing that she can do is some sort of like foreign body removal because the med pod is specifically set up for male bodies. And when Charlize Theron's character gets out of her cryo sleep, she's the only female character who is not affected by cryo sleep. Like all the men are up like doing jumping jacks and stuff. And she's coded as just being like, she's hardcore, but she's like doing sit-ups. And I'm always huh. like, wait wow. a minute. Like, Interesting. Oh, like queerness or just she's butch. I love, I love her character. I think you're missing one important fact. Ooh. What? She's just the flamethrower lesbian. Huh. She's the vast was <laughs> of this movie. Yes. She's flamethrower lesbian. The other one's machine gun lesbian. And that it was just an homage to the original. Oh, that Perfect. scene was so hot. Like, <laughs> like Dr. Holloway, there's they're like, she, he's not getting on this ship. Mm -hmm. And she she smokes him. Yeah. And then he shows up like super mutated, Ooh. throwing people around the room. I was like, wow. Oh, that was so exciting. All right. Well, before we lose our entire audience nerding out on Alien, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be discussing the news welcome back my darlings and as promised now it's time for all of the news updates from the worlds of hollywood and horror as the clock strikes midnight and the cuckoo comes out of its oh sorry wait cuckoo was last episode never mind oh well the dark specter of terror remains cloaked in a veil of darkness and these current events remain tainted by the suffocating evil of this week's updates from the worlds of hollywood and horror on tonight's broadcast, we have a small roundup of upcoming projects and updates, beginning with the announcement of brand new film and television offerings based on Remedy's Game of the Year and other awards-winning video games, Control and Alan Wake. Following in the success of The Last of Us, the game developer will hopefully capture a similar magic on the silver screen. Moving to smaller screens, Joel McHale, star of Assassination Nation, Becky, and other genre films, has been announced to be joining the cast of Yellow Jackets for the upcoming third season. And, going behind the camera, A24's Camp Crystal Lake series has a brand new showrunner with Brad Caleb Kane, most notably from the series It, Welcome to Derry, newly at the helm. Interesting. I'm just never going to be cool with that. I can't support it's it. Weird. Yeah, I just can't. I don't, I, know, I don't think I will. I know what they have planned. I was, so, I was legitimately excited and yeah. couldn't wait to watch it. And now I'm like, no, because mm -hmm. I know they're not going to do anything like the same story at all. And it was so good. I love Joel McHale, too. And, you know, we love we're all fans of Yellow Jackets. Mm -hmm. But Yellow Jackets is kind of fucking up a little bit. I, I feel like too much time is going by. Mm -hmm. Like in, in the modern day, we need we need satisfaction and we need it when now. <laughs> <laughs> Nine years later. Well, speaking of right here, right now, let's move on to franchises that won't die no matter where they're banished or how their physical forms are desecrated. More Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice tie-ins have been announced right before the film comes out with AMC offering signature ghost green ICs for filmgoers and, actually cooler, an officially licensed Ouija board coming soon to summon the ghost with the most. Fans of spirits more corporeal with their calendars on hand will want to mark their schedules for a new Chucky attraction at Halloween Horror Nights with a late night talk show called Late Night with Chucky, announced exclusively for the Halloween Horror Nights Hollywood location this year. Oh, we get something. I know. <laughs> That's exciting. Fun. 
Finally. We get the bad Harry Potter. We get all of it. <laughs> <I'll>, <laughs> or we don't get any of it, I guess I should say. Bad Harry Potter that I cannot ride. Like, it's those weird, not oh, yeah. VR, instant vomit. <laughs> but we did it, and we were like, I was like, wait. I've done this ride before, and this is actually kind of good because I thought it was crap. It's the one with the the dangle legs, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, and like a dragon flying around. Like, and I feel like they changed <laughs> it, or something. I, I think I don't they know. changed it. Nothing will be scarier than the time that the three of us were in line for the Simpsons ride, though. Oh, like, oh my yeah. god! I thought we, we were gonna die. We were. <laughs> it was like we the were, purge or something. I yeah. was like, "What's happening?" I think we cr- crisscrossed into like different dimensions in that waiting line. Like that was weird. <laughs> I really thought for a minute. I was like, "Maybe they took the ride because you know how they'll reskin something uh-huh. and just throw a clown in there and try to scare you." Yeah. So I thought maybe it was like that, but it it was just weird. I was so annoyed because there were very few people in line. <laughs> we had to wait a thousand years to get in we get in then i didn't realize it was one of those just like sit down and watch a movie ride and then it had the nerve to like be so disrespectful and shoot water in your face i'm like get me out of here i hate it here oh my god and finally two light and cute offerings before i return to my child-sized coffin Speaking of Alien and Alien Romulus, Fede Alvarez has been communicating with fans online recently and revealed a very cool Easter egg for Alien Romulus, stating that Ripley's escape pod can be seen in the background of the film's opening alongside the xenomorph. And for our pop girls listening, pop star Sabrina Carpenter's latest music video surprised fans, and me, with its co-star Jenna Ortega this week in a horror-reference-filled feast with Death Becomes Her as the through line. There's nothing real to report on this except horror continues to do what? Slay. It was cute. I there watched it. Cute. Yeah. She's just a little too young to really appreciate Death Becomes Her, in my opinion. She has no idea, but <laughs> she has I, no I, idea I appreciate the, the honor. <laughs> I was more impressed with the Ginger Snaps reference. Like, oh, which I missed that. Yeah, where she falls onto this. Oh, the fence. Yeah, on yeah. the fence. Mm-hmm. So wait, you're saying you can see Ripley's... What what is it life? Thing? Believe what it or not, escape pod. Where? <laughs> okay, listen. Do that you remember I don't that? know. There's it's it's when they're basically they're moving the xenomorph from you know it's it's like this sort of like asteroid kind of thing. They're moving oh, it right. through the hull of the ship, oh. and it's like a blink and you miss it. Like as they're passing by some of the other artifacts and wreckage there's an escape pod in like the very back of the scene and that's confirmed now to be ripley's pod this may be close to the something that i read about um romulus where if you recall from alien the original she ripley uses like that grapple hook to kind of shoot out at the the xenomorph and then you know it gets dragged behind the ship and then it tries to go in the engine and she burns it off well you see that grapple hook somewhere oh yeah that's cool yeah it's kind of neat but which pod would it be because she actually stayed on that one for like 50 years so it couldn't have been that one that's strange i didn't write Hmm. the movie All right, everyone. And now it is time for our Junior Mints Movie Club review. For this week's film, we decided to watch Oddity, which is a 2024 Irish horror film written and directed by Damien McCarthy. It centers on a blind medium and curio shopkeeper who is still grieving the death of her twin sister a year prior. And a lot of strange things that happen after that. So let's get into this film. (laughs) Something odd is happening here. Something really weird is happening here. (laughs) Look, I think this movie had mood and atmosphere galore. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe the best thing about it. It gave me a couple of really good good scares like mm-hmm. not, not not cheap jump scares either the kind of scares that make the hair stand up on the back of your neck rippling goose flesh yeah. for sure that it gave me that a few times i feel very similarly i think that i need everyone capital e everyone to stop hyping movies up to the point where they can't live up to the hype exactly yeah this movie has a 94 percent on rotten tomatoes does it really yeah it's way up there. yeah oh wow okay and i was like I, and, and i saw that and i'm like ooh, 94 okay mama like let's strap in strap on my extra large medium like let's go but <laughs> That's where I uh, do a meme myself. <laughs> if a medium can do all that, what can a large? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. baby. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> oh, Jack, that was good. I love that. And I just like the movie a lot. And I agree. I mean, there are some. I didn't scream ever, but I did go a couple of times, which is fun. It, yeah. It's it's a fun film. I think it's a good feather in Shutter's cap. Is it fan? Is it ten out of ten? 
No, but I did like it. Well, I guess it's a nine out of ten based on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> what did you nine point four? I, <laughs> I felt like I kept coming in and out. There were moments in the film that I thought were truly scary and terrifying and chilling, and. Sometimes I was I was with the actors, but then on the other side of the coin, some of the actors I was like, I'm not. I, this is really obviously oh. weird. And and the other thing was, while I saw moments that were truly scary, the moment that wasn't happened <laughs> right off in the beginning when she opened that little peephole and that guy looked. That was camp. I was like, this is silly to me. With the eye, with the, the contact, I was like, I'm not in... It, I, it took me out of it completely. I couldn't take it seriously either, <laughs> honestly. It, and then later we learn that it's actually a prosthetic and the eye is missing, which I actually think is pretty cool, especially mm-hmm. if, if a blind seer who has that ability to touch objects and see their past and their story, seeing through someone's eye is a very cool message, but it didn't look like that. It looked like someone came to my house and stole one of my contact lenses <laughs> and put it in that guy's head for this movie. <laughs> I similarly had a question about the eye, and I don't mean to question anyone's taste level or how expensive a good glass eye is but the more they show and because they show the eye a lot it would be just one thing if it's like kabam you see it and then it's gone I'm like, why does this eye look like someone took a Bic pen and like scribbled on it? Yeah, I've never seen a fake eye, so I don't know. Maybe they look like that, but I thought the same thing. I was like, shouldn't this be like rounder or right, something? Right, yeah, the know. shape was irregular. Yeah, was and maybe oh. they are to keep them in. I don't know. Okay, this is really weird because I've actually been spending a lot of time on blind talk, and I've been seeing a lot of prosthetic eyes recently. What so did they look like? That the shape is correct. Oh, like it's it's sort of mm. it, it's to fit like within the eyelids. Okay, but, you know, and there's a lot of different designs. Like I've seen. I mean, basically, like any design you could put on a set of D&D dice, you can put on a prosthetic eye. But this one, I was like, so you just got the like, I'm going to create people out on purpose special. Well, by the way, I never want to see your FYP ever. I can't even imagine. (laughs) I can't imagine. (laughs) Oh, I'm sure you could. You don't want to imagine, but Uh, you could. This was a new addition that I wasn't (laughs) expecting. You're always full of surprise. (laughs) Let me ask you guys a question. There's an artifact in this movie and she gifts it to her dead sister's ex-husband. And it's that wooden sculpture of a man. Mm -hmm. This is chilling. I think when we see it's, it's gaping mouth and it moves, but on me, I think I may be very desensitized for this type of kind of subtle scare because it it wasn't chilling to me. It wasn't scary to me. I know it was supposed to be. And I'm wondering if other people, people that are voting in the 94% on Rotten Tomatoes percentile are saying like, wow, this is like super chilling. But for someone who's hardcore into horror, maybe not. What did you think? I had assumed that it was leather at first because I'm like, exactly how did you fold this up and put it in this trunk? Now that we know, later you find out, spoiler, that the thing can animate and move around. Maybe she had to get in a fetal position and then put it in there. I don't know. But it was very strange. I'm like, how did you fit this solid piece of wood in this trunk? A hundred percent. And why are we accepting that that is okay? Yana, who is the the (laughs) ex-husband's new girlfriend, probably the best character in the movie. Oh, she's great. She was so cunty and just cutting. And I'm like, oh, I like this girl. Mm -hmm. Um, But she like sees the wooden thing move. Like it it pops up in the chair and then it's looking in another direction. Then it moves his arm up. I'd be like, this is supposed to be a statue. Like what is happening? But no mention of it. There's a lot of suspension of disbelief in this movie. I think... I have never experienced this before, and I don't know if anyone has experienced, if anyone has experienced, uh, you know, their friend coming over and bringing them a wooden body or whatever, and it, it animating, and them not freaking out. I mean, girl, the second that she brought the trunk in and opened I'd be like, you need to get the fuck out of my house. Right. Oh, we get, were totally doing it. Get the f- <laughs> like. No. I was yeah. like, movie over. Credits roll. But she did sort of overstep her boundaries in a, in a pushy way. And mm-hmm. maybe because she's d- disabled, you know, I don't know. Maybe you would just be like, uh, okay, I don't it, know. No, okay. it seemed like she was pushing that card and like forcing these impositions on everybody around her. And I was like, I looked at Drac and I'm like, this woman would get on your nerves. And he's like, oh my God, I hate her so much. <laughs> I right. I'm like, if you knew her. her. Yeah, because she, oh she was so rude and like stepped over boundaries. And just pushy. And then like, can you make me some food? I'd be like... Okay, I know you're blind, but I'm about to beat your ass. <laughs> and for me, she was giving spooky Tabitha's takeover. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> and she did take over, didn't she? She certainly she took like, over this crime Give me scene. your keys. Yes. I think that the initial scare of the creature or the figure, it's weird. It's very unsettling. It's odd question mark mm-hmm. but i think that the actual best scares in the movie come from the camera flash absolutely i was like, like that's that, oh yeah oh really that see is, i thought oh. there was scarier moments like even when the guy came around the corner in the stairwell and first saw the the wooden guy down there the way they presented that that's hard to not make cheesy and i actually think it wasn't cheesy i thought it was kind of scary this movie had moments where it really mm-hmm. shine like oh these are like really potent vignettes right and then we kind of got into weird territory but then you'd see more and for me the best scare was when yana again is up in the bedroom and she finds the camera <gasps> yes, and then it, yes. and then the sound the soundscape was really great too and god i'm getting the chills again and then she sees the ghost and it's like run and I was like, oh, yes, <laughs> yes. My favorite scare comes from the same scene, but it's like, I think right before where Yana, who, and again, this I, it's not my movie, but she gets into bed fully dressed. And I'm like, I don't do that. I do not get into bed fun. Like, I'm not like, I'm an EP. Like, let me get in my bed with my fucking day clothes on. Like, I don't do that. But she gets in bed and she's no. like. <laughs> so funny you say that. That's what happened in Aliens with that new character. Yeah. She went to put her in bed and she was in her full dirty ass clothes. I was like, who would do that? Anyways. <laughs> but not Ripley, though, because when she goes into her, oh, when she goes into her, her cryo bra, she's like, her panties. let me show these panties. I want to show this little crop top. Let yes. everybody know how hot I am. Yes. She's like, I'm the only woman on this yes. ship, and I'm going to let you know. No. So, you know, Yana is in full daywalker clothes. And then she's like, let me look at some home movies. And she's just going through the camera. And I love found footage. And so when she watches that clip the first time, I was like, oh, this is a little unsettling. Like, you know, the camera pans over and you see the husband with the, the blanket over his head. Yeah. Yeah. And then again, a little bit of a suspension of disbelief. She rewatches the clip. I'm like, you already seen it. Just skip ahead. Right. But she rewatches it, and then it's the ghost when it turns. And I, I should have seen it coming, but I got gooped. Oh, I got nice. Got. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, and then she saw it in the corner of her room. That was another really terrifying moment. Yeah. So it kind of came in and out, didn't it? Yeah. There were other vehicles too for the storytelling. What one of them that I thought was so slick and I didn't see it coming was I'm going to leave my phone here, which no one would do that, but yeah. make sure you answer it. And then he removes the latch, which I didn't think that was going to work. And it did. And so it, it was like double. That shocking. was disturbing that her falling through that. It yeah. was weird. I mean, I liked it cause it made, it was unsettling, but it was a strange choice for sure. Mm-hmm. At that point I was fully on Tabitha spooky takeover. I wanted her to win. <laughs> I wanted her to be like, yeah. uh, escape from witch mount and like kill everybody <laughs> and like get away with it and like bring her sister back or like, you know, live in that house with her sister as a ghost or something. I agree. Like I was like, when she was like, I'm going to take everything from you yeah i was like yes tabitha take it all do it yes and she's like and bring ivan here so i can kill him yes. i was like wow i'm i'm, I'm believing her and same i mean i did enjoy a scene where ivan gets his toes not on did like, you like that? i was like oh, yeah. i was like now we have gone into full <laughs> goober territory yeah. with this but i kind of yeah. live for it <laughs> that was one of those moments i was like okay we're back to campy i'm like what What's happening? She's getting her toes sucked off. <laughs> it's giving that scene from Talk to Me. <laughs> oh my God. I just took a bite. Ow. So, okay. That being said, do you think that there's anything about the movie being like Irish that there could be a sense of a different sensibility in any way or no? I have maybe a controversial. Yeah, yeah. Take. What is it? I don't know that it's a cultural sensibility, but I do think that this movie does a lot. I think this movie does a lot with what I am guessing is a little. I, I think, think so too. Yeah, like I think that there are elements that just flat out work and look great. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree, agree with that. that. I also agree with something you said earlier, which was the hype of the movie, I think, affected it. Because this came out around the same time that Long Legs came out. And mm-hmm. what was the other one that was hyped up to be really scary? And I don't even remember what it was now. Um, Cuckoo. Cuckoo. Oh, yeah, Cuckoo. Cuckoo. That, yeah, but okay, Cuckoo that, was good. It was, but still, they all three of these films were... I think on the lower side of budgets, they were Mm -hmm. indie movies and they were presented to be the scariest movie you've ever seen. And then, so literally I remember after long legs, someone said, well, if you didn't think it was super scary, watch oddity because that's, remember? Yeah. So that's what it is. It set me up. Now, if I just came across this movie on shutter and watched it, I probably would have loved it. Sure. 
Well, dear listeners, we do hope you enjoyed this episode's Junior Mints Movie Club review. We are going to take another quick break, and we'll be right back. All right, it's time to reach into our bag of listener mail to answer all of your burning questions. Ian, will you do the honors? Dia Bones from Indiana writes, First off, I want to say how much I adore your work. In a world full of drag competitiveness, you both stand out as true pioneers, bringing something so unique and brilliant to the scene. Your blend of horror, glamour, and creativity is simply unmatched, and I can't thank you enough for keeping the spirit of Halloween alive all year long. As a huge fan of both horror and spooky season, I'd love to hear more about how you both got into horror and Halloween. What drew you to this dark and delicious world? I feel like I've talked about this on the podcast before. Both of us have different stories, but I feel like it is, it's always appealed to me from moment one. Like any, the, the furthest I can think back, I was thinking about horror stories in my head and making up little scripts and comic books and stuff like that. And I've just always been into horror. I remember one of the first movies I watched was Dracula with Bram Stoker. And I was way too little to be watching it, but it was fun. And maybe that's what happened to me. I don't know. (laughs) But I've always, I think part of it was like, like uh, I had a bit of social anxiety and I liked the quiet stillness of, you know, horror and spooky things. Mm. It was always very empty and dark and quiet, which I like quiet. I do not like loud shit so yeah i don't know maybe that's what it is but i've always been into horror and i feel like our career has sort of led us up to this point i agree with that right when we look back and i'm like oh we did this and we did that and we did that and it, it, it when we were doing it i was like I don't know why we're doing this, but it all came together in this perfect harmony. So, yeah. yeah. And similarly, I was the kid who had a collection of long black capes in my room and I would like go downstairs and turn off all the lights and put on my Dracula cape and like walk around like I was the coolest, scariest thing around. And I worked in haunted houses and I've just always been obsessed with the villains of every story and the darkness. And I'm attracted to the fantasy and the, the kind of like the drama of this world. And that absolutely includes Halloween always has. And that's why we've thrown the LA Halloween ball for like upwards of 25 years. Like this is our absolute favorite time of year. Duh. And we really go to the nines. Can't believe we started a party when we were five years old. I know it's so weird. (laughs) And now you are the coolest and scariest thing. (laughs) And still you're so young. (laughs) Almost 30. (laughs) Nick from the granite state asks, With all that's going on in the world in terms of politics and conflict, I am often amazed that Drac and Swan seem unaffected by it all and manage to bring a positive attitude to the podcast every week. How do you maintain your positive demeanor in the face of the adversity our community is facing in the U.S. and the world in general? One of it is experience, all right? One of the things that that keeps us centered is experience because... I've been outraged so many times only to see it really nothing happen that much. Of course, we need a certain side of the aisle to win and to, you know, it furthers all of us and advances society and all that stuff. And some of the other beliefs are very backwards. But the truth is, I think our democracy is set up in a way that like it can move a little to the left or the right, but it would take something huge to really disrupt it. So I think we have less panic about it. We're more patient, I suppose, is what it is. For me, I think it's that I can't control conflicts in the Middle East. I can't control the political tug of war in this country. It's it's infuriating. It's maddening. It, you know, it, it gets right into you. But what I can control is my own attitude and the attitude in this house. And if people are listening and they're fans of ours, I can give a little bit of that. And, and, and thank you for everything that you said too. I really appreciate that. But we, we, the truth is we are affected by those things, but we just choose to steer in a different direction. Yeah. I mean, you are really good about that too. Like I know that you've, you are able to put on a positive attitude despite things like, where did that come from? For me, I think that it comes from really treating your positive attitude like your armor. And I remember I growing up, like I was very sad. I was very depressed all the time. And I realized that if I could make other people laugh, it could make me happy. And so over time, it just became my armor and I wore it all the time. And now I find that, yes, life is hard. Life is scary sometimes and it can be very uncertain. But if you have a positive attitude, you can really change your own outlook on things. You can make things better. And truly, like 
when we're doing hard stuff, like I remember like just being on tour and when it's hard, newsflash no one wants it to be like hey let me just be a total sour sport like right. it's like bad attitudes it's like get out of here can you yeah. say that to drag one more time <laughs> <laughs> no but it's like it's like one of the things i love about like our alchemy is like you know when something crazy is happening or when it's hard like it's hard but then one of us will crack a joke and it's like okay like let's remember like what's fun about this for a second yeah and it's just it, it, that is to me the way to do it you got to remember to have fun with it because otherwise yeah there is conflict it's the, the world is a scary place but you got to be scarier so listen you're sparking all kinds of memories and i agree with you and i and i love our energy and i love the struggles when we look back and i feel like i need to give you an apology because during season five, I was a backstage bitch and you were like <laughs> trying to keep it positive and you're telling a story about, oh, you know, someone cracks a joke. I was like, um, not me. My temperature was through the roof and I was ready to kill anyone, including you. Oh my God. <laughs> Sorry. It is all good. Apology accepted. And for people out there who don't know, drag at this level is not fucking easy. No, it's like, not. not fun. Holy shit. But I do know that that's something about you that you that you change. And so do you feel like the fake it till you make it kind of works in a way? A little. I mean, I don't consider it to be faking it. Not like, faking, but you know, like if you take on a positive attitude, even if you're feeling negative and you lean into it, it will turn into a positive attitude. Yeah, I, I do. But the thing, I guess for me, like I saw this thing recently and I think that it's more like self-esteem. Like if you don't, like yourself, or you don't think that you're good at something, the best thing that I think you can do for yourself is to every day tell yourself, I love you. I think you're fierce. Like, I, I think that I can do this. I can do this. And you may not believe it, but over time, when you repeat that to yourself over and over and over again, you at least have one voice that's telling you, hey, you can fucking do this. And over time, you're like, well, wait a minute. Maybe I can do this. Like, instead of being negative about yourself all the time, like, you can you can start to wear it. It's like a, like a venom symbiote almost. Mm -hmm. Belief matters a lot. Mm -hmm. Belief is such a huge part of manifestation. And you can't fake it. You can't, you can't like, fake it. Yep, I believe. I totally believe in this. But you're kind of like, I don't know if I believe in this. It's totally. not going to work. But if you really believe, you will be nominated for an Emmy. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Hopefully on the next podcast, we'll be flexing our Emmy win Ooh. wins. Look, even <clears throat> being nominated is so gratifying to me. Like yeah, I am, so and cool. I'm not saying that from a humble point of view. I mean, I really am satisfied with that. I'm still gooped. Goop you lot. No, I'm, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping that in. <laughs> Kayla writes, I don't know if this has ever been asked before, but I'm wondering if any of you, if you're familiar, have a letterboxed account. I loved listening to the Long Legs review and was really looking forward to hearing what y'all thought. I would love to see what other movies you guys are watching and what you think of them, even if you don't talk about them on the pod. Yeah, I do not. We don't have a letterboxed account at all, but someone in our PR department loves letterboxed and has been talking to them about getting us in there. So I guess we're going to come in and do something for Halloween with horror movies oh, or something. That's cool. So we will have an account soon. And finally, Slaytina from the Philippines asks, hello, Mother Boulez. I just want to ask if you have any plans to come to Asia. I mean... If there's invitation out there, the answer would be yes. Like, I, I'm sure Drac and I would both love to come to Asia to experience not only the scene and, like, what's happening there in the nightlife, but just the, the culture. Um, we went to Asia for the first time at the beginning of the year, and we absolutely fell in love. Um, we don't have any plans at the moment, but once upon a time, Hosa was whispering in our ear to bring us out there to potentially make our debut um, in South Korea, which I think would be awesome. Yeah, I mean, we only took her all over the world five or six times. <laughs> but, you know, don't worry about it. Whenever you feel like getting to it. Hosey yeah. May, take your time. <laughs> I will say, culturally, Japan was so amazing. Like, I, to this day, think about out of all the countries we've been to, because we've been all over the place at this point, and a lot of times together, I feel like the culture there is most appealing to me from anywhere we've been. Mm, yeah. I could see that. Better than when that Scottish guy threw us out of the way of the train and all that <laughs> real nice behavior. But we, we do love Scotland, despite that guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are rough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm going to get in some fist fights here. Okay, cool. Yes. 
All right, my darlings, that's all the time we have for this episode of Creatures of the Night. Thank you all for listening. And if you love us, you'll have to prove it by rating, subscribing, and reviewing wherever you get the best podcasts around. Thank you, my darlings, and we'll see you next time. Oh, and I almost forgot. Starting next week, we'll be in full swing for everything from the Boulay Brothers Dragula Season 6. The Boulay Brothers Creatures of the Night is hosted and produced by Drac Morta and Swan Thula Boulay, along with co-host Ian DeVogler, with music by Neuron Spectre.